this is my son Charles and his cat Tigger. <laughs> and um, you know, my involvement with the foundation was really born out of a deep despair for what was happening with my son. Seven years ago, he started having seizures, and they went from one a month to one a week, and then one every day, and then dozens every day. And I just sat and I watched him lose the ability to read and write, and slowly lose the ability to communicate the way he used to. And I could just no longer stand by and watch that. It was just too heartbreaking to me. So I made a promise to Charles to do whatever I could to help him. And uh, you know, so so we as a community have a lot of power. We can contribute our data. We can participate in clinical research. And I see one of the most important roles of the foundation is to sort of channel all of our collective, um, kind of our time and energy, and really um, use it towards trying to develop therapeutics and perhaps even cures for our children. So a lot has happened in the last few years, the last couple of years especially, there have been some amazing breakthroughs, and throughout today you're gonna hear about some of those. I wish we had more time to talk about everything that's happening at research, but there's really been too much. So today we're basically gonna skim the surface and give you all the very broad overview of what has been happening in research. And I'll just reiterate what Sue said. You know, the foundation is going to change and it will grow and our community has grown so much and as a response, we, we are going to have to make some changes and um, I think those things are going to be inevitable, but we will never ever lose sight of the fact that our children are our priority and when it comes to research, this is about trying to make their lives better. So these are just a few of the highlights um, that have been going on in research. There are now multiple animal models of family McDermott syndrome. There are several mouse lines that are all a little bit different in a new mouse um, in which the entire shank gray gene has been knocked out. It's an important mouse model. You're going to hear about some of those models today. There's also a new rat model of family McDermott syndrome. And this is really important because um, Rats are, are very costly, they're time consuming and difficult to develop, but they actually may be better models of things like autism and developmental, the kinds of developmental issues that our kids are dealing with. So this is important, this is being done by um, Dr. Buxman at Mount Sinai. There's now a primate model in development, and this is exciting because there are, there's only one other primate model of autism or developmental disability that I am aware of. It's in that and so for us to be kind of one of the first diseases where this is being developed is pretty exciting. Now I will say this is going to be several years in development, and this is going to be a very kind of long and expensive project to do. Um, Many of you have given skin punch biopsies or blood for induced polypropylene in stem cells, and I'm excited to say that several months ago there was a new paper that published the first findings about the neurons that were grown from these induced polypropylene stem cells. Dr. Shablov Talk will be here this afternoon to talk about that, so thank you to all of you who have participated in, in giving your skin punch biopsies. You know, we hear a lot about, in the news, just about kind of these novel genetic engineering approaches, and they're very exciting. Uh, to be completely honest right now, those technologies are probably years away from being effective for treating Bell and McDermott syndrome, and they're something that we want to pay attention to. But maybe the more promising approach, you know, for the next five to ten years, will be understanding what's going on with pathways, what's happening in the brain, and how does, um, not having enough shank 3 or other kind of related proteins in the brain affect pathways and researchers are now working on that and are looking at ways that they can target those pathways and that's going to be probably the best path towards um, treatments for our children. And I'm also happy to report that there's been an increase in industry interest. A few years ago, I'm really not sure that any pharmaceutical companies had any programs in Van and McDermott syndrome and now I know there are a few and they're excited to move forward, and um, I think this is a really positive step forward for our community. I feel much better about where we are now than where we were four years ago. So, you know, what we're thinking about now is I mean, where most of this research is going is towards um, the development of therapeutics for family McDermott syndrome. This is an extremely difficult process. Just to get to the point where we are right now, developing animal models to study disease, that, that's been a huge barrier, but we've kind of, we're, we've moved, we, we, I would say the scientific community has successfully navigated some of the preclinical things that need to be done. 
Now we're looking at things like clinical trials, and that's really, really tough. It is very difficult to have a successful clinical trial. We're finding a lot of things that are, you know, do we have the right target? Or do we have the right drug? Is it in the right dose and for the right duration and in the right patients? And we're we looking at the right kinds of measures of success. So when you look at this, I think this is a very optimistic um, estimate. Maybe 13% chance of a drug being successful in a clinical trial. And once you get to that point, you have to think about things like, what is the FDA going to say? Sometimes their decisions may be almost a little arbitrary, whether or not they um, will approve the drug. So what are we going to do about that? So one of the most important things for optimizing conditions for success in clinical trials is really good clinical research. And this is one of the most exciting things that's happening now in Baylor McDermott Syndrome Research. You're going to hear some things like deep phenotyping and biomarkers and natural history studies. And I just want to tell you briefly what these things are and why we need them right now. So deep phenotyping is really about understanding Fallon McDermott syndrome sort of in a deeper way than we have always understood it. It's more than long eyelashes and cracked toenails. It's really about what's happening in the brain. How do you measure that through MRI, functional MRI, EEG, eye tracking studies, and behavioral phenotyping? And these things are important because they can suggest further um, just research on circuits that are involved or pathways that might be involved, and that can lead to better target identification. Target identification is what you need in order to find drugs that might work. And to also help us understand what is it that we're really trying to cure in Bale and McDermott syndrome, or treat in Bale and McDermott syndrome. Um, biomarkers are sort of these measurable indicators of underlying biological processes. So it's really hard to go and look and see what's happening in, inside somebody's brain. And so are there other kinds of measures that can help us understand what's going on with these pathogenic uh, mechanisms of our disease? And they're important because they can help to provide objective measures of response to treatment. So we can know, are these drugs really making a difference? And can we also predict which patients might be the best responders to certain uh, therapeutic approaches? And finally, you'll hear a lot about natural history studies. And these are studies that look at patients, generally that look at patients longitudinally. And they're important for understanding sort of the prognosis. And um, really, also, when you think about if we're going to give a drug and see, measure how that changes a patient's outcome, you want to know what is the natural progression of the disease to begin with. So here's, here's kind of how I see the foundation filling the gaps. We know there are lots of gaps. Right now, um, there's a lot of scientific interest in family McDermott syndrome, and there's finally some funding coming from the NIH and from other funding um, institutions such as Simons Foundation, Autism Speaks, and Autism Science Foundation. But there's still a lot of gaps. And so I have been thinking a lot about what's not going to happen if our foundation doesn't do it. And the first thing that we can do, or have an extremely important role, is engaging families in research. And the ways that we're doing that right now are enrolling families in our patient registry. That's very important. You're going to hear more about that from Megan later this morning. Um, and we're helping researchers enroll families in clinical research studies and in clinical trials. The other, the second area where I think we can make a difference is really making the resources available for research. And this doesn't just mean funding science. It means helping to make biosamples available, helping to make data available through our patient registry. And one thing I envision in the long run would be to develop a, a, like a directory of reagents that would help scientists find, you know, where's that mouse model, where's that antibody, where's that tool compound that I can use for my um, experiments. And then finally, um, our last kind of area where I think we feel kind of a unique niche is convening the research community. There's nobody that has more at stake in family McDermott syndrome research than our community. So we have been organizing symposia to bring together the researchers, and these are important ways of kind of helping to build collaboration among the researchers and meetings. So our next symposium is going to be November 13th and 14th in Washington, D.C. This is going to be held in conjunction with the Society for Neuroscience meeting. It's a very large meeting. And our meeting will be Thursday and Friday before Society for Neuroscience starts. And uh, it is going to be very heavy on the basic science, very heavy. But families are welcome to come. It is a little costly because having a meeting in D.C. in conjunction with Society for Neuroscience turns out to be rather expensive. So the registration fees are quite steep. If you're interested in maybe referring your neurologist or geneticist to come to the meeting, I've left a few flyers in the back. I've also left some sponsorship forms in case you have an employer 
or if you yourself would be in, um, interested in funding some young investigators to attend the meeting. So here are our opportunities that we have this week. Um, the first is there's an opportunity to participate in a biosample collection. Mount Sinai is doing two studies. One is a microarray study for families that have never had microarray before. And they're also doing a study that involves patients with small deletions and mutations. And it turns out that we actually have quite a few biosamples from many of our families, but we have very few samples from patients with mutations of shang or extremely small deletions. So if you're interested in participating in that, um, Stacey Lurie from the Zebra Autism Center is here. She's in villa number 4102, and you're welcome to go down there and talk with her. Um, to find out if you might be able to participate in one of these two studies. Um, there are also going to be opportunities to enroll in the patient registry, and we actually need everyone who's in the registry to re-consent and answer a few additional questions. So please stop by the BOCAS today, either at lunchtime or in the afternoon after 2.45, 2.45, right? 2.45 to 7 p.m. And there's a special, can I say, there's a special gift for people who come by and um, participate in the registry. It's a free, beautiful navy blue t-shirt. <laughs> um, and uh, so you can do that today, you can do it Friday or Saturday as well. There will be also in that same room, there will be an opportunity to meet with some of the researchers who are beginning clinical research studies. And um, there's going to be an opportunity to consult with some genetics experts. Those are Dr. Bettencourt, I don't know if she's here yet, and um, Dr. Phelan. So I just want to, just a brief thank you. This year has been amazing. We really accomplished some, some important things, and we have to thank a couple of parents. So Taryn, I see. Taryn, stand up and let us say thank you to you. Okay, Diane isn't here. Okay, she helped us with a huge, enormous grant application, which we were we were awarded the, the contract. And Megan will tell you about that project a little later. And then, of course, Megan, who's just worked tirelessly, tirelessly on the 